Good evening. My name is uh, Josephine Palumbo, and I'm the president of the University of Ottawa Alumni Association. Bonsoir, je suis Josephine Palumbo, président de l'Association des diplômés de l'Université d'Ottawa. Merci de participer ce soir à la reprise. Thank you for being here today for this really important event for our university. The series of lectures called Alex Trebek. On behalf of the University of Ottawa, we make a point to offer an Indigenous affirmation in support of reconciliation. Nous rendons hommage au peuple algonquin, gardien traditionnel. We honor the Algonquin people, natural guardians of this territory, and we recognize and acknowledge the very lengthy and historied relationship they have with this unsurrendered territory. We also thank all those individuals who live in Ottawa and are Indigenous, whether they're from here or from elsewhere in Canada. We acknowledge the knowledge keepers of all ages. And we also honour their leaders of yesterday, of today and of tomorrow, whose courage is undeniable. Most distinguished alumni was the late Alex Trebek, who graduated from here in 1961. We recently marked the second anniversary of his passing, and he continues to be missed by many in Canada and indeed around the world. Alex was a proud and lifelong alumnus of the University of Ottawa. Over the years, he generously supported his alma mater by donating more than $10 million. This included a gift that allowed us to launch the Alex Trebek Distinguished Lecture Series, through which we invite renowned speakers to visit and to discuss important issues related to public policy, social action, health, wellness, and other global issues. Pramila Patton, the distinguished speaker who joins us this evening truly personifies this designation, and we will hear more about her compelling topic shortly. Les événements comme la conférence de ce soir qui aborde des questions... Events like tonight's lecture, which address difficult issues, are critical to advancing the conversation and finding solutions to major global challenges. These events allow the University of Ottawa through its faculty and through its research community, through its alumni and through its friends, to shape a more inclusive, sustainable, and prosperous world. And our efforts are getting noticed. That last month, the Times Higher Education 2023 World University Rankings placed the, the University of Ottawa, our university, in the top 140 universities worldwide. This is a climb of 25 positions for our best placement ever. And we are indeed so pleased of this achievement. And as president of the University of Ottawa Alumni Association and an alumni myself, I'm so very proud to represent our accomplished and our amazing alumni here in Canada and around the world. We are helping to support a vibrant and growing institution, and I would like to thank my fellow alumni for their continued support. Before we go further tonight, I would like to provide some notes of a few housekeeping matters. First, this event is being streamed via YouTube Live. The links for English and French video streams can be found in your confirmation emails and on the event website. Second, this discussion is available in both official languages as we're doing simultaneous translation for those here in person and those watching online. You're welcome to pick up a headset from our team at the back of the room and select the language of your choice. Finally, Madame Patton's speech will be followed by a discussion with three U Ottawa experts in this field. First, Nadia Abu Zara, Associate Professor, Joint Chair in Women's Studies from the University of Ottawa and Carleton University. 
Also, Padma Osman, publisher, social communication and gender-based violence consultant. Padma just received her PhD in social sciences at the fall convocation two weeks ago. So congratulations, Padma. And finally, yes. And finally, Lou Raisonnière, doctoral student, political studies, faculty of social sciences, University of Ottawa. They will touch on questions submitted in advance by audience members and thank you to everyone who sent in their questions. And with that, I am now honored to turn the podium to our president of the Uni Uni University of Ottawa and our vice chancellor, Monsieur Jacques Fremont. Merci beaucoup, Madame Palumbo. Thank you, Madame Palumbo. Madame Chancellor Emeritus, you get la belle. And Emer uh, former Governor General Michael Jean, Vice Rectors, Deans, members of the Board of Governors, members of the Senate, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much for being here tonight. We are here today to talk about a very difficult but crucial subject. Last Friday, here in Ottawa and on the campus of the University of Ottawa, as across Canada and the world, we underscored and marked Remembrance Day. It was also a time to remember, of course, those who lost their lives during war, but also it gave us time to consider the brutal damage that war and conflict bring to entire societies. Tonight, we will hear from someone who is working tire tirelessly to break the silence about the tragedy of conflict-related sexual violence. You well know that conflicts all often entail sexual violence, which pushes families to flee their area to never return. Sexual violence in wartime promotes early marriage, as a means of survival for girls and also often entails the birth of many children from rape. These and other tragedy, tragedies are the focus of tonight's lecture. Of Ottawa, I'm truly honored to welcome Pramila Patton as this year's guest speaker of the Alex Trebek Distinguished lecture series. Her topic, while difficult, reflects the commitment to intelligence and humanity that the late Alex Trebek, who we lost just over two years ago, sought to explore through this lecture series. And I should add that we are sorry that Jean Trebek and the children were not able to join us tonight. The Trebek family will always be part of the U Ottawa family. Mrs. Patton is the United Nations Under Secretary General and Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict. And in this role, she is making it her life's work to address the global tragedy of conflict related sexual violence. Since being appointed to a position in 2017 by the United Secretary, United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, Mrs. Patton has documented and spoken out around the world to underline the extent of this global uh, tragedy. She has illustrated out how such violence has taken place, not only in past conflicts, but continues to take place 
in current day conflicts around the globe, as we speak, actually. Mrs. Patton challenges us to label sexual violence not just as cruel and barbaric behavior, but as a strategic and targeted weapon of war. Avocate d'origine mauricienne, Pramila Patton. Lawyer from Mauritius, Pramila Patton is a member of the Committee to Eliminate Discrimination Against Women since 2003. Since 2014, she's been part of a high-level advisory committee that's in charge of the global implementation of the UN Security Council's Resolution 1325 on Women, Peace and Security. She's also part of the advisory group for the Observatory on African Women's Rights at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa and since 2010. Her long career gives her a diversified expertise in terms of peace, security, and women's issues, including sexual violence and gender violence. Ms. Patton holds a master's of law degree from University College Collin, University College London, and a Bachelor of Laws degree from Ealing College of Higher Education in the United Kingdom. To honor not only those who have seen battle, but all people affected by the hardship of war. I know Mrs. Patton will expand on this and other concerns. And she does so to send a message that for those using sexual violence as a weapon in conflict zones, the world is watching and will respond. Therefore, I would invite you to join me in welcoming the 2022 Alex Trebek Distinguished Lecturer and recipient of an honorary doctorate from the University of Ottawa, Mrs. Pramila Patton. Merci, uh, Cher Jacques. Honorable Michael Jean, 27th Governor General of Canada and Chancellor Emeritus of the University of Ottawa. Mrs. Huguette Labelle, Chancellor Emeritus of the University of Ottawa. Jacques Frémont, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Ottawa. Mrs. Josephine Palumbo, President of the Alumni Association of the University. Vice President, Secretary General, Deans, Members of Senate and the Board of Governors, Professors and Students, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, good evening. I would like to express my sincere appreciation and gratitude for the invitation to deliver this prestigious Alex Trebek Distinguished Lecture. I thank all of you present this evening for your interest in this very painful subject, the scourge of sexual violence in conflict, which has been called the world's least reported and least condemned crime. Sexual violence has been used as a tactic of war, terrorism, and political repression, primarily against women and girls, but also against men and boys, with devastating repercussions that linger long after the guns fall silent. It is an invisible, cheap, and effective weapon of war. Invisible because the world does not witness rape in the same way as bombings or landmines injuries. Unlike other war crimes, it may leave no physical evidence while inflict inflicting profound psychological scars. Cheap, because it requires no weapon system other than physical intimidation, making it low cost, yet high impact. And because perpetrators know that victims will not report due to stigma and shame, fear of rejection, and fear of reprisals, 
allowing them to enjoy near total impunity. And effective because it shreds the social fabric, forces communities to flee their homes and homelands, dehumanizes, destabilizes targeted groups, and shatters lives and livelihoods with consequences that echo across generations, including in the plight of children born of wartime rape, who are often condemned to live in a legal limbo in the shadows of society. The reality is that we meet at a time when conflict-related sexual violence is again in our daily headlines. It's unabated brutality on 21st century battlefields and its recurrence with each new wave of warfare continues to shock the collective conscience of humanity. We are going through a massive global turbulence marked by multiple cascading crises, increased militarization, and the highest number of violent conflicts since 1945, including an epidemic of coup, which have turned back the clock on women's rights and resulted in record numbers of displacement. Against that backdrop, I will address the evolution and impact of my mandate as United Nations Special Representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence in Conflict, a relatively young mandate which was only established in 2009, although sexual violence has been part of every war since time immemorial. On the evolution of my mandate, the past decade has ushered in a dramatic paradigm and perspective shift in the way sexual violence in conflict is addressed. This has catalyzed real change in three critical respects, namely in terms of the normative framework, our institutional arrangements, and our operational impact. Firstly, on the normative evolution, the United Nations Security Council has adopted a comprehensive framework of 10 resolutions on women, peace and security, no less than five of which specifically address conflict related sexual violence. It was in 2008 that the issue of sexual violence as a tactic of war was first elevated onto the agenda of the world's paramount peace and security body the United Nations Security Council through the unanimous adoption of Resolution 1820. For the survivors, this meant that their ordeal would be taken seriously, not only as a violation of individual human rights, but also as a threat to collective security, an impediment to the restoration of peace, and a crime of concern to the international community as a whole. For the Security Council, it meant dismantling the old gender divide between hard security and so-called soft issues between political and private matters and seeing war through the eyes of women and girls whose bodies have been part of the battlefield. This new approach affirmed that there could be no security without women's security. It brought new urgency, attention, and resources to bear on an issue as old and seemingly immutable as war itself. It served to directly engage a broad constituency of peace and security stakeholders responsible for imposing targeted sanctions, mandating training and deploying peacekeepers, supporting ceasefire and peace negotiations, establishing commissions of inquiry and hybrid tribunals, and referring situations to the International Criminal Court. In short, it gave security actors new responsibilities and gave survivors and their advocates new avenues for accountability and action. In terms of institutional arrangements, in 2009, the Security Council adopted Resolution 1888, to equip the United Nations with new infrastructure to respond. 
and this included the creation of my mandate as special representative of the Secretary General on sexual violence in conflict to provide coherent and strategic leadership to global efforts, including as chair of the Interagency Coordination Network, UN Action Against Sexual Violence in Conflict. It also established a team of experts on the rule of law and sexual violence in conflict to strengthen institutional safeguards against impunity at the national level and called for women protection advisors to be deployed to the field to enhance our monitoring, reporting, and response. Other important resolutions followed, such as Resolution 1960 in 2010, which authorized new monitoring analysis and reporting arrangements at country level as part of a system of deepening the evidence base for action and pressuring parties to comply with international norms by listing or naming and shaming those credibly suspected of committing or being responsible for patterns of conflict-related sexual violence. Then came Resolution 2106 in 2013, which emphasized critical dimensions such as early warning and prevention and the need to empower women and women civil society organizations. Resolution 2331 in 2016 condemned sexual violence as a tactic of terrorism, including trafficking in persons for the purpose of sexual exploitation, which has been used to fund and fuel the operations of armed and violent extremist groups. This resolution was a response to transnational terrorist groups such as Daesh, which reduced women and girls to an expendable currency in the political economy of war. And the most recent resolution on conflict-related sexual violence came in 2019, Resolution 2467, which called for a holistic survivor-centered approach to guide all prevention and response efforts. And for the first time, it also recognized children born of wartime rape as rights holders. Turning to operational impact, today the United Nations system is reaching and supporting thousands of survivors who had once been invisible and inaccessible. Peacekeepers are now systematically trained on how to prevent, detect, deter, and respond to sexual violence as part of their operational readiness to protect civilians. Sexual violence offenses are now an integral part of international criminal investigations. Sexual violence has increasingly been included as a standalone criterion for the designation of sanctions, which represents a dramatic shift in the practice of these bodies, which were virtually gender blind a decade ago. The United Nations has 15 sanctions regime, nine of which now include conflict related sexual violence as part of their designation criteria, with the newly mandated sanctions committee on Haiti being the most recent example. This means that arms embargoes, travel bans, trade restrictions, and asset freezes can now be imposed on individuals or entities implicated in planning, directing, or committing acts of rape and other forms of conflict-related sexual violence. My operational methodology is to secure commitments with national authorities in affected countries to prevent and address sexual violence and to anchor these commitments at the highest level through concrete implementation plans and strategies. To date, my office has signed agreements with 12 countries and most recently with the government of Ukraine in May of this year. Since I took office in 2017, my three strategic priorities for the mandate have been firstly prevention, including through justice and accountability, converting cultures of impunity into cultures of deterrence through consistent, effective, and visible prosecution. Secondly, fostering national ownership, leadership, and responsibility for a sustainable survivor-centered response. And this means ensuring that survivors have access to appropriate high-quality services, including healthcare, 
psychological support, legal services, and livelihood activities, especially in cases where survivors have been rejected by their families due to harmful social norms related to stigma, shame, and victim blame. The survivor-centered approach views survivors not as passive beneficiaries, but as the co-creators of solutions. And thirdly, addressing the root causes of conflict-related sexual violence, including structural gender inequality, discrimination, marginalization, and poverty as the invisible drivers in times of war and peace. I am encouraged that my strategic priorities have been reflected in the Comprehensive Security Council Resolution 2467, adopted in 2019. In terms of current trends and emerging concerns, while significant normative progress has been achieved at the global level, it is clear that words on paper are not yet matched by facts on the ground. If civilians continue to suffer sexual violence in situations of armed conflict, it is not for a lack of international norms and institutions to protect them. It is because existing norms are inadequately implemented and enforced. It is because existing institutions are not backed with sustained political and financial support. The annual report of the Secretary General on conflict-related sexual violence, which is compiled by my office for the year 2021, paints a disturbing picture of sexual violence being used as a tactic of war, torture, terrorism, and political reprisal. The gap between commitments and compliance, resolutions and reality is evident on every page of the annual report. Despite COVID-related restrictions, 3,293 cases of conflict-related sexual violence were verified by the United Nations in 18 country situations, representing a significant increase of some 800 cases compared with 2020. The vast majority of incidents targeted women and girls, 97%. 83 cases were recorded against men and boys, with the majority occurring in detention settings, and 12 verified cases were found to target LGBTQI individuals. Considering that sexual violence in conflict is a chronically underreported crime for multiple reasons, ranging from stigma and shame, fear of reprisals, lack of trust in the justice system, amongst others, the data only represents the extreme tip of the iceberg. While the report conveys the severity of verified incidents, it does not capture the full scale and prevalence of this chronically underreported, historically hidden crime. In almost all settings covered in the report, impunity for crimes of conflict-related sexual violence remains the norm, and the pace of justice is painfully slow. The level of compliance by parties to conflict with relevant international norms and resolutions also remains appallingly low. The annual report includes information on parties to armed conflict that are credibly suspected of committing or being responsible for acts of rape or other forms of sexual violence listed in an annex often referred to as the list of shame. And the 2021 report lists 49 parties uh, operating in 10 conflict-affected countries. The report also surfaces painful human stories, all of which cry out for justice and redress. In northern Ethiopia, a young woman was taken to an Eritrean Defense Forces camp, where 27 soldiers raped her, as a result of which she contracted HIV. An elderly, visually impaired woman was shot by soldiers after being detained for three days while her daughter was being raped by members of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces in an adjacent room. An adolescent boy was raped in Himora, who later committed suicide. 
The bodies of a woman and two girls were found days after their kidnapping and rape by armed elements in the Central African Republic, where sexual violence has doubled over the past year. In Afghanistan, professional women, including in the security sector, have been targeted for their work to address sexual violence, with a female police officer who was eight months pregnant being brutally tortured and killed in Go province. The recent report of the Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine, dated 18th October, confirmed that some Russian Federation soldiers have committed sexual violence crimes affecting victims of all ages, ranging from four to over 80 years old. The Commission confirmed cases of sexual violence in which Russian armed forces rape girls when entering or occupying civilian homes as well as cases of children who had been raped, tortured, unlawfully confined, killed, and injured. The report refers to some disturbing cases, including a case documented in Kyiv region in March 2022, where two Russian soldiers entered a home, raped a 22-year-old woman several times, sexually abused her husband, and forced the couple to have sexual intercourse in their presence, while one of the soldiers forced their four-year-old daughter to perform oral sex on him. In Chernihiv, in another region, the commission investigated two cases of rape committed against women over 80 years of age. An 83-year-old woman described how, while her village was occupied by Russian armed forces, she was raped by a Russian soldier in her house where her physically disabled husband was also present. Last month, I conducted an official visit to South Sudan, where the level of sexual violence is shockingly widespread and brutal, leaving victims with physical, psychological, and social scars for possibly decades to come. I met women living in displacement camps in Juba, where it seems that almost nobody is safe. Women of all ages, including those who are pregnant, are all under threat. Many men have also fallen victim. The survivors I met in Juba and Yambio in Western Equatoria province recounted harrowing ordeals. Between February and May of this year, the UN has documented 139 cases of rape and gang rape in just one province of South Sudan. In Yambio, I met several children born of rape who have no birth certificates, no access to education or healthcare services, and are suffer suffering from trauma and mental health issues. All of my field missions consistently reveal major gaps in services and resources, which make it difficult for victims to move forward as survivors. For instance, when I visited Iraq, I met with Yazidi women and girls who had been held in Daesh captivity and subjected to the unimaginable brutality of sexual slavery. Several months after their release, they had received neither medical nor psychological support. Some were in a semi-comato state. Others were suicidal. Specialized trauma care was absent. Justice and reparations seemed entirely out of reach. Excuse me, I'm looking for some water. Oh. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, survivors, most of whom had been abandoned by their husbands, gave me a powerful lesson on how their physical insecurity was linked with their economic insecurity, how economic support fosters self-sufficiency self-esteem and resilience, which in turn reduces their exposure to risk, bolsters their perceived worth and value in the eyes of their community. Yet access to education, credit, and economic opportunity remains severely constrained for these women, often afflicted by the double tragedy of rape and rejection. The prevalence of sexual violence in conflict across time and space 
teaches us that reinforcing prevention, protection, and service delivery is critical from the onset of any armed conflict. Yet my last visits to Sudan, South Sudan, Somalia, Mali, and the Central African Republic were under the chilling reminder of the countless rape victims who remain invisible and marginalized due to collapsed institutions and a climate of insecurity in remote regions controlled by armed groups. Survivors were forced to walk for several days to reach even the most basic healthcare facility. And this is despite the fact that when it comes to post rape care, distance can be a death sentence. And in Ukraine, the situation is no different. As the humanitarian crisis continues to deteriorate, with mounting numbers of casualties, refugees, and people forcibly displaced inside the country, access to protection and assistance services remain restricted. In neighboring Poland and Moldova, I met with Ukrainian refugees and heard countless stories of fear, distress, and terror, which led me to conclude that the international community must not overlook the brutal mental health toll being caused by this ongoing war. Although the challenges remain daunting and new protection crises continue to emerge, it's not all doom and gloom. My office sense of concern, calling for restraint, unimpeded humanitarian access, comprehensive service provision, and effective investigation. Despite significant funding shortfalls, the two operational arms of my mandate, the team of experts on the rule of law and the UN Action Network, which comprises of 23 UN entities working and delivering as one, are supporting governments to implement these formal agreements, reaching countless previously unreachable or invisible victims. The team of experts on the rule of law works closely with many affected governments from DRC to CA, Guinea, Iraq, Sudan, South Sudan, Mali, Somalia, Nigeria, amongst others, to support the investigation, prosecution, and adjudication of crimes under civilian and military justice systems, legislative reform, and the protection of victims and witnesses. My office is able to deploy very swiftly. For example, in May, I went to Kyiv and Lviv as a matter of urgency to meet with the national authorities and civil society actors on the front lines as part of efforts to bolster the UN system response and to ensure that the issue would not be shrouded in silence. Through my visit to Ukraine, I wanted to send first and foremost a clear and strong signal to perpetrators that the world is watching, that their acts will not be without consequences, and that it will not be cost-free to rape a woman, a girl, a man, or a boy. I also wanted to send a message to the survivors that they are not alone, that the United Nations, that my office, that the international community stand in solidarity with them, and more importantly, to urge them to break the silence and denounce the perpetrators. On 3rd of May, I signed a framework of cooperation with the government of Ukraine to support the design and delivery of priority interventions in the areas of justice and accountability, multi-sectoral service provision for all survivors, gender responsive security sector reform, as well as prevention of conflict related trafficking. In 2021 and 2022, we have seen a number of encouraging developments in the area of justice and accountability, as well as legislative reform in the DRC, South Sudan, the Central African Republic, Guinea, Iraq, Colombia, Guatemala, and Kenya, to mention just a few. I'll only share a few examples with you, which include the opening in Guinea of a landmark trial on 28th of September 2022, exactly 13 years 
after a stadium mass massacre by the military, which left at least 157 protesters dead and 109 women and girls victims of sexual violence, with the country's former coup leader, Moussa Dadis Kamara, amongst those charged. Moreover, a law on reparations was also enacted last month in Guinea, in addition to the establishment of a national reparations fund, all with the support of my office. In Iraq, my office supported the Council of Representatives, and they adopted the Yazidi Survivors Law, which provides support to victims of Daesh atrocities. In the Democratic Republic of the Congo, a national reparations fund was also established last year in November, and my office is currently supporting the elaboration of a law on reparations, which is due to be enacted this December. Moving forward, my office is undertaking a number of, of key initiatives, because when history looks back on these painful episodes, as part of the long litany of battles fought on the bodies of women and girls, we will rightly be asked, what did we do to honor our commitments? And in this regard, I wish to highlight some key initiatives from my office to combat this heinous crime. Firstly, prevention permeates every action I take. Albeit a crime as old as the history of war itself, conflict-related sexual violence is preventable. It is not an inevitable byproduct of war. It is not collateral damage. But unfortunately to date, most of the responses to conflict-related sexual violence have focused primarily on intervening with affected individuals and helping survivors after the violence has occurred. While these strategies are essential to mitigate the devastating mental, physical, social, and economic effects for victims experiencing sexual violence, and it is important to continue to improve these responses, there is also a compelling need to invest more on prevention. And in discharging my mandate, I'm guided by the firm conviction that the earlier and deeper the seeds of prevention are sown, the better and more sustainable their fruits will be. Accordingly, on 21st of September, my office launched a prevention framework which aims to enhance both structural and operational prevention. Structural prevention includes addressing gender inequality as a root cause and invisible driver of sexual violence in times of war and peace, while operational prevention includes more immediate risk mitigation measures and early action in response to red flags and early warning signs. The purpose of the prevention framework is to assist all relevant actors and stakeholders, governments, as well as UN agencies to improve and expand their programmatic efforts to better prevent conflict-related sexual violence. The framework, which is intended to be a roadmap to address prevention efforts, is being rolled out in the countries falling within the purview of my mandate. Coming to legislation, only comprehensive legislation can provide the foundation for a holistic and effective response. It is critical for states to adopt a comprehensive legislative approach, encompassing not only the criminalization of all forms of sexual and gender-based violence and the effective prosecution and punishment of perpetrators, but also the prevention of future violence and the empowerment of survivors. Although over the past decades, many states have adopted or adapted legislation to prevent and respond to sexual violence in conflict, significant gaps in legal frameworks persist, and such weaknesses in the laws and procedures allow perpetrators to escape punishment and deny victims the right to a remedy. Last year, my office launched model legislative provision and guidance on investigation and prosecution of conflict-related sexual violence, which contains state-of-the-art legal provisions required to prosecute 
any form of sexual violence. My team of experts on the rule of law is currently supporting a number of countries in their legislative reform process and rolling out the model legislative provisions. Children born of sexual violence in conflict as rights holders. Throughout history and across diverse geographic contexts, children have been born of sexual violence in war and everywhere. They are stigmatized in post-conflict societies as children of the enemy. They are marginalized and rejected within and outside families and exposed to a range of physical, psychological, economic, cultural, and legal risk and harms. Disturbed by what I saw firsthand during my visit to Maiduguri, Nigeria, in Iraq and Bosnia and Herzegovina about the extent to which these children and their mothers are stigmatized, isolated and deprived of resources and exposed to discrimination and marginalization by their own communities. I intensified my advocacy on the subject, which resulted in UN Security Council Resolution 2467 in 2019, recognizing for the first time the existence of these children as rights holders with rights distinct from their mothers and rights connected to their mothers. The Security Council mandated me to prepare for the Secretary General a special report on women and girls who become pregnant as a result of sexual violence in conflict and children born of sexual violence in conflict. The report sets out a platform of legal, policy and operational recommendations, including reforming discriminatory nationality laws and practices. Work is already underway in a number of countries for the implementation of these recommendations. Focus on sanctions. Impunity for wartime rape remains the rule and accountability the rare exception. To break the vicious cycle of violence and impunity, we must use all the diplomatic and enforcement, enforcement tools at our disposal. And that is why in recent years, I have been advocating for sanctions and judicial accountability measures to work in tandem. Today, more than ever, we need strong and effective sanctions against individuals and entities implicated in planning, directing, or committing acts involving rape and other forms of sexual violence. Accordingly, I brief on a regular basis sanctions committees and make recommendations for targeted measures against perpetrators and spoilers to the peace. Only in December, I'm briefing four sanctions committees. Economic empowerment is another area where I am placing a lot of focus because there's a demonstrated link between women's economic security and their physical security. The vast majority of victims of conflict-related sexual violence come from marginalized, destitute, and often displaced communities. There is a strong correlation between economic desperation and dependency and exposure to sexual violence and exploitation, including trafficking, forced prostitution, and recourse to harmful coping mechanisms such as child marriage. I am accordingly focusing on economic livelihood support for survivors and those at risk, including for new partnerships forged with the private sector. I'm also intensifying my advocacy for reparative justice, because in addition to livelihood support, structurally transformative reparations can help to break the cyclical connection between poverty and sexual violence. International law recognizes the right of victims to a remedy and reparations. However, reparations remain the justice intervention that survivors demand most, yet receive least. And reparations are the most victim-centered justice intervention and the most significant means of making a difference in the lives of victims. My team of experts on the rule of law is currently supporting a number of countries in this regard, including to develop new legislation on reparations. The other area where I'm placing a lot of focus is the need for specialized mental health services. 
Sexual violence, especially when left unaddressed, seriously affects the victim's mental health with dire consequences in the short, medium, and long term. Mental health and psychological support interventions are essential components of comprehensive care for survivors. Recovery from rape and the associated trauma is a deeply personal and highly individualized journey. The alarmingly high rate of post-traumatic stress disorder among survivors of sexual assault is a strong indication that the current responses are inadequate and need to be survivor-centered, rights-based, and trauma-informed. Accordingly, my office is focusing attention on the urgent need to go beyond psychosocial first aid and to provide specialized mental health care, including holistic therapies for victims of conflict-related sexual violence. My office is also engaging actively with religious and traditional leaders to encourage them to use their moral authority and work with the perpetrators, especially the armed groups, but also to combat stigma by shifting culpability from victim to perpetrators. And in this regard, my office has also signed a framework of cooperation with religions for peace. My office is continuously expanding its circle of allies through frameworks of cooperation with a number of treaty bodies focused on the rights of women and children, notably the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, but also the Committee on the Rights of the Child. We have signed a framework of cooperation with the Interparliamentary Union and also a number of private sector actors. In 2019, my office also launched a global champions initiative to engage prominent personalities in this cause. In conclusion, I would like to say that today we stand at a crossroad in the history of addressing sexual violence in conflict. We have a choice to make, either to defend the gains we have made over the past decade and turn commitments into compliance and resolutions into solutions, or to retreat in the face of the new conflicts that have erupted on almost every continent, and which reminds us that outside our conference halls and meeting rooms, sexual violence continues to be a pervasive tactic of war, terror, and political repression. If we are truly committed to eradicating this scourge in a sustained and meaningful way, we must confront the reality that implementation is grossly lagging behind and that the rule-based international order is under severe threat. The Women, Peace and Security Agenda has a transformative potential with its robust normative framework that reaffirm that sexual violence in conflict can be prevented if we act boldly and decisively. The same normative framework that remind us over and over again of the responsibility that we bear to care for survivors of these heinous crimes. Survivors need more than our solidarity. They need tangible support in the form of accountability, reparations, and economic reintegration as well as significant investment in structural prevention. Policymakers must match their promises with meaningful action to leverage behavioral change. Protection from sexual violence, even in the midst of war, is not merely an aspiration. It is a legal obligation. I will continue in my advocacy role to urge the international community to give this agenda the attention, investment, and action it deserves to replace horror with healing and hope. We know which path we are duty bound to take. As we navigate the long and winding, winding road from rhetoric to reality, the plight and rights of survivors must be our moral compass. It is indeed time to act. We must rise to the challenge of our times in action is not an option. Governments must recommit to ensuring that the robust global framework 
is no more an empty promise. 13 years after the creation of my mandate, we owe the survivors no less. I thank you for your attention and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Dr. Patton. Distinguished guests, allow me to welcome onto the stage Padma Osman, publisher and consultant in social communication and gender-based violence and an alumna of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Ottawa, like many of yourselves. Allow me also to welcome onto the stage Lou Raisonnier, étudiante au doctoral, au doctoral. who is a PhD student in political that is a faculty of social sciences at the University of Ottawa. Questions and discussion together. Is there a difference between the way we must respond to gender-based violence or conflict related conflict related gender violence because i chair un action network uh, which comprises of 23 un entities and i'm always struggling uh, with with this question because often there's a tendency within the un because as i mentioned my my mandate is a young mandate was only created when, in 2009 and that is the distinction that i have to make all the time that my mandate is in the big box of what many call gender-based violence uh, or sexual and gender-based violence my mandate is part of of that big box and that the, it is critical to make that distinction between because the whole point about sexual violence in conflict and post-conflict context is that it is being used as a tactic of war it is being used to dehumanize it is being used to instill fear it is being used because it is effective it's intended to destroy not only the victim the woman in most cases and the girl but the entire family community uh, and in context for example like the drc uh, we see how to displace people sexual in the east eastern part of congo how uh, it is used uh, our groups come and ask the village to relocate to leave they refuse but once they start raping babies uh, and the women and the girls and they spare no one, people leave. And it is effective and it is it is low cost because the uh, impunity is, is, is the norm. Uh, unlike gender-based uh, violence, and I always uh, have to make this point with my colleagues uh, about the survivor-centered approach. Uh, why is it important to have, uh, to understand the experience of the survivor of sexual violence in conflict because the experience is completely different without undermining a victim of FGM uh, or uh, domestic violence, which other agencies with programmatic mandate deal with. Uh, but there is, there is a distinction. And sometimes I get the argument that uh, you should not create a hierarchy of survivors. And my point with, my, with the survivor-centered approach that I advocate since 2017 is precisely that you need to understand the specificity of sexual violence used as a tactic of war and increasingly as a tactic of terrorism uh, which call uh, which uh, to which the security council rightly responded promptly with resolution 2331 uh, and, and and recognizing uh, the use of sexual violence as a tactic of terror and, and terrorism which funds the political economy of, of war and we are also increasingly seeing the use of sexual violence as a tool of political repression in the context of election 
post electoral electoral violence so that is that is a distinction that that you have to make i mean like you uh, and 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 there's also the fact that in the context of of, of uh, conflict related sexual violence you also have other victims which i mentioned during the lecture children born of children born of rape uh, who are also uh, condemned to a, to a to a life of, of, of stigma i recall when i was in maiduguri northeast uh, nigeria i was in a room with 200 200 girls between 12 to 14 very tiny girls they had babies and i asked my staff to count the number of of babies in the room there were 166 babies in that room and and the girls were telling me that the babies were being called Boko Haram snakes by people in the camp and that they were also further abused by other people uh, on, on, on the camp there was no safety and security for for them so the, it's it's uh, intergenerational stigma and the, the abuse conti continues. Thank you, Dr. Patin. You said so in your speech, but I'd like to know, with respect to gendered violence, there's often, on one, the one hand, prevention, and on the other hand, reaction to the violence. How do you draw the distinction, or did you draw the distinction throughout the, your mandate between these two aspects, and which measures did you implement for those two things, prevention and intervention? I have a mandate to prevent and respond to conflict-related sexual violence. And I must say that was my COVID uh, coping mechanism. It was during COVID when there was nothing else to do than work 24 hour a day, literally, uh, that I was like, thinking uh, because I was very concerned during COVID not being able to do field mission and leaving behind the survivors. I, I knew that the sexual violence would not uh, would not stop. I was very concerned about the impact of impact of COVID on the mandate in terms of reporting, in terms of service delivery, knowing that people were working from home. The frontline service providers were, were not uh, there anymore. Uh, even my senior human protection advisors were, were were not able. There were there were COVID related restrictions to their to their mobility, and like I was I was like deeply concerned about also justice and accountability, knowing that uh, uh, courts were closed, and uh, and then I started looking at more prevention and how do we how do we prevent, uh, and I started. I pick the phone and talk to people in the field and I say, okay, please tell me where's your prevention work and where's your response work. And I, I, I got to realize that we use prevention and response interchangeably. And in the end, after a couple of months of, of uh, engagement with actors in the field, everybody agreed with me that we were doing more response. Uh, and even the response was of often quick fix uh, response and but many of them had a valid explanation that donors do not fund prevention work so there's no money available for prevention work and they want to see where they have put their money i mean like they'd rather invest in a shelter in a one-stop shelter than than work on addressing root causes or empowering women and, and a range of of uh, uh, other measures that's when I started uh, working on a prevention framework. And then in 2021, when I returned to the office and I sat with my team and I said, I cannot present a prevention framework because it has to be driven uh, in the field. And I decided to drive it through the UN Action Network. And, and that was brilliant because I got 23 UN entities sitting together, united, uh, in the aim of working on a prevention framework, you know, from the Office of Counterterrorism to the Office on Disarmament uh, to UNHCR dealing with refugees, each entity looking at how they, what they should do to prevent, uh, to prevent sexual violence in conflict, working 
taking the dimension of the justice sector reform, law as, as a price tariff, to security sector reform, uh, to a range of actors that we need to, to get on board, uh, to the work of peacekeepers. So we addressing the, the root causes and also having like a surgical uh, diagnostic. And, and that also led me to, to realize that uh, we, we really have to be, uh, to be precise. If we are to bring the appropriate response, we really need to understand, is sexual violence in this particular context, in this particular region, really being used as a tactic of war? Or is it opportunistic rape? Or is it lax command responsibility? Uh, or is it cultural? And, and so it, it was, it was a, a great exercise that we did, and that's when I launched the uh, UN Action Network. We launched that prevention framework uh, on the 21st of September during UNGA. And now the plan is to work on individual implementation plan for each country, and again, having the entities around the table uh, to design uh, specific measures which each entity will be responsible for and to roll out the prevention to roll out the prevention framework and as i said the response uh, in terms of service provision holistic service provision uh, un action network has also worked on uh, an exercise of unpacking that survivor centered approach what should it mean in the context of conflict related sexual violence a response adapted to victims of sexual violence and taking an intersectional approach of addressing the, the, the needs of women, the needs of girls, men and boys. For example, one gap that I have noted in terms of response is that there, there are no services adapted for men and boys, victims of sexual violence, where the stigma manifests itself. And I have met during field mission men and boys who have told me that they, I mean, like men who told me they went with their wives, they were both raped, and they were turned down. They were, they were told, we have, we cannot help you. And uh, so it's like an NGO uh, who then supported, supported them. So we, we really need to take that intersectional approach, uh, looking at the services that you provide to children who are victims. In Somalia, for example, the majority of victims of sexual violence reported cases are children and you really you really need tailored services for for uh, for, for children Dr. Bateng, um, hearing you talk when the world is waking up and making coffee and getting ready for breakfast you're heading out to the most dangerous places on earth and your job is significantly important and sig significantly dangerous so getting there, how do, you, how do you see that the steps and supports survivors are calling for like the most important? That's, that's a really good question. And that is why also during COVID, my way of staying connected with survivors, because I could not leave them for two, three years on their own, was to collect testimonies uh, of survivors and service uh, providers and we we published we, we had a publication which we launched also recently which is called in their own words uh, to to get the insight from from them and we had some guiding questions one of the guiding question was uh, whether what happened to you could be prevented but also uh, in terms of what are their expectations from the UN, uh, from, from member states, from civil society and from service providers. And also, as I said, for me, uh, when I took office in 2017, the first thing that I said to my team uh, is that Resolution 88, which establishes the mandate, was created for survivors. It has the face of a survivor, a woman and a girl significantly impacted by sexual violence, but also men and boys and that that will be that will be uh, that that will guide me during during my my tenure so wherever i go i meet with survivors first and foremost as well as civil society organization 
and then I engage with government because my role is to amplify their, their voice and to convey to government what I hear from them. I will say that they ask for mainly two things. Uh, maybe, yeah. Uh, firstly, they ask for livelihood support. And uh, because these are, these are women who are mostly, I mean, even the girls, because the girls I met in, in my Duguri, they had all been rejected by their families, although they were abducted by Boko Haram from their schools or from their home. But there is that stigma, especially when they came back, because they were forcefully married, but also forcefully impregnated. So they all came back with babies. So they were rejected by their, by their families. So the, the girls, as well as the women, are struck by the double tragedy of rape and rejection. And they ask for livelihood support. Uh, and I have seen the power of, for example, a sewing machine that you give to them. What, what, how transformative it, it can be. And that's why I'm focusing a lot on, on economic empowerment, on livelihood support for them. But they also ask for justice. But justice is, takes many shapes. I mean, like they, they, they want reparative justice. That's why I'm also, uh, because not, not everybody is going to have their day, their day in court. Uh, and so reparations, reparative justice is, is critical. For example, in, uh, uh, in Iraq, when I spoke to the Chief Justice of Iraq and I sp spoke to the Minister of, hum uh, of uh, Human Rights, and I told him, I recall, Minister, when I was, when you were before the Human Rights Council, I was sitting in that room and listening to you, and your whole speech was around Daesh being a monster because of what they did to the women. You were, you were focusing on the sexual violence that was inflicted on, 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 on the women and the girls. Uh, but today, you have not prosecuted a single case. So there will be no historical record of what happened to the, to the women, uh, to the Yazidi women and, 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 and girls. And, and you are only prosecuting uh, under your anti-terrorism law. And his response to me was, uh, Mrs. Patton, uh, prosecuting for, for under the anti-terrorism law is, is, is much easier. It's an open and shut case. In 15 minutes, I only have to prove affiliation. And uh, we, 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 we get a conviction in 15 minutes. Uh, so... And then his other, when I say this, and I'm, I'm a lawyer by profession, I have practiced law for 35 years. We can, we can be very technical. You have this law, you have that law, and we can, we can support you. But of course, we cannot support the death penalty. That was the constraint that I, my office had. But I said, we can, we can support your legislative reform, and we can support uh, prosecution. And uh, then his, again, his response was, or you know these women cannot uh, these, these women cannot identify they, they 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 cannot they cannot identify the perpetrators the average woman has been sold 10 times uh, and raped 20 times by uh, so for him he could not uh, so we we wanted to bring test cases but we were we were never able to to do that and that is why through universal jurisdiction we are able now to get a few conviction here and there in, in Germany and, and elsewhere. Uh, but for the women, it's, it's very distressing because some of them want to have their, their, day, in, their day in court. Uh, for them, that's justice. And for them, justice is justice at home. It's not justice before the International Criminal Court. And uh, justice is, is, the road to justice is very long. As I told you, I was in Guinea on the 28th uh, of October for the opening of the trial, 13 days, day for day. The massacre was on the 28th of October, 2009. And uh, I happened to, to, uh, to be part of, I was part of that commission of inquiry. I was appointed by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and to be there 13 years ago and to say, that's how long it takes. And I know many survivors who have passed away because I have been working with the survivors for so many years. Uh, many of them have passed away. Uh, 
in in Iraq, uh, the Yazidi women they've they've, they've lost hope. So uh, that's why I'm very happy that we were able to support the government with the Yazidi survivors' law, at least providing them with with reparations, including in the form of education, of of jobs, of land. Uh, we 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 uh, so th th that's also so reparation is also something that that many of them ask and uh, and they have also taught me that justice without reparation is not justice i was in the drc and i met this woman who told me you know i was supported by by your office with your mobile courts and uh, i uh, i was raped i was not rejected by, hus by my husband or by my village uh, i i uh, went to court it's a mobile court in in the, in the village she said i i um, I saw my perpetrator in court and, and I won the case and the court awarded reparations uh, but I, n I never got the reparations uh, because they were, they were not enforced and she said after the case the whole village came to know that I was gang raped uh, and, and that the shame was, 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 was intense uh, on my family and my, my husband asked me to, to, uh, to, to leave the village and so justice without reparation is also problematic so it's it's about to to answer your question i think it's justice livelihood support but first and foremost of course it's it's uh, it's services i mean and, and and that you have to also provide timely it has to be when a woman has been raped the services especially sexual and reproductive health it has to be timely and and and, and quality quality services but it's all a question of funding because I, uh, I'll be very honest. We we are we are failing a lot of uh, people because we simply do not uh, we do not have the resources that we that we need. I mean, like if the resources are there, I mean, like I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I have success stories in a number of countries. If I get the resources, uh, I I can do wonders and. Uh, and I keep saying this uh, since February because uh, as much as the world attention is focused on Ukraine and rightly so, but Ukraine should not, uh, the situation in Ukraine should not eclipse uh, other conflict and the survivors in all these other countries mm -hmm. because I, uh, I am now suffering, my mandate is suffering from uh, uh, cuts due to COVID compounded by Ukraine because already some of my traditional donors have indicated that they may not be able to support for a number of countries on account of uh, of the war in Ukraine. So uh, it has a cost. Uh, we we know what survivors need. We we but we need the we need the resources. On behalf of everyone in this room, I, it's an honor to be able to thank you to sit beside you and to hear the things you have to say. Not least because you speak not only about recent years, but about an entire career of working in this domain. And I think this is what's really special. What you bring, what I find very fascinating is that instead of only speaking in your current position, you can look back and say, and this is what I saw during a commission of inquiry while being a member of a commission of inquiry. And this is what I saw in this previous incarnation and this and this. And I think that entire career dedicated to a form of justice that is forward-looking is what is very, very special about the way that you run this mandate. I think what's something that we all admire and all recognize is the way in which you've seen the constraints and then strategized, said, okay, well, the donors would like to see a building, but what the survivors are asking for is prevention. And if the donors won't do this, then I'll create a UN action network of 23 entities. And I just find that very inspiring because what you're doing is you're saying, I see a brick wall, I'm going around it. And because you know the various systems at your disposal, you've been working within these systems long before you came to this position. And so you set an example of how this can be done. And one day people will say, this is the approach that everyone thought was impossible. Everyone thought, well, we need to save people, 
not let survivors lead the way. And instead you're coming and saying, no, we're not gonna go save anyone with our capes. Instead, we're going to let survivors lead, survivors advise. When you said that you go to a country and you meet the survivors first, and then the non-governmental organizations, and then the government entities, I thought that if everyone were to operate in those ways, we would have much better international solidarity and cooperation. You, I didn't hear always the word solidarity, but a few times in your speech, you said this is about solidarity. And that denotes for me a position of equity, a position of understanding, that you see eye to eye with the people you're speaking with. You're not there, as I said, to, to come with a red cape and save, but instead you're there to speak with them eye to eye to say that you understand the situation that they're in and that you recognize the role that not only the international community but also local agencies and entities would and should play. So from everyone in this room, we'd like to give you a very, very warm sense of gratitude and appreciation. Thank you very much. for joining us this evening and may our paths cross again. Thank you. Thank you.